Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about the Bible in 10 Minutes, a new project we worked on with Ascension Press that went viral. We're going to be talking with Peter Ferguson, the animation director on the project, about defining the visual language, of coming up with the look, and of coming up with something that can boil the entirety of the Bible down into 10 minutes. Did we do it? Let's find out. Welcome to Heralds and Fools, a Coronation Media podcast where we talk shop, where we talk about passion projects, client projects, and the nitty gritty details of what makes creative life so special. Hey, Peter. What's up, Gary? So let's talk about this video. This was a fun project we recently did with Ascension Press. It's called Mm -hmm. The Bible in 10 Minutes. Um, And yeah, I mean, the name says a lot. It walks through the entire Bible. Right. In 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about it. A short summary. Um, it's essentially basically in the title, <laughs> but but Father Mike Schmitz had a huge impact um, on, I don't know, I don't, what do you say, Catholic culture, Christian culture in sure. general with the, the Bible in a year podcast. I think that topped the top of the iTunes yeah, charts. Yeah, I, I think it was still sitting, if not the top faith podcast, like very near, like even last week. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's still, still just pumping huge, through. still just totally cranking. So yeah, you're right. A huge impact. So Ascension is a long-term client. We've done a ton of work with them. Mm-hmm. A lot of the work we do with them is actually in the educated or the educational space. It's mm-hmm. for their parish programs and things like that. This was cool and unique for our work with Ascension because it was so out there on YouTube. And there was, I mean, the yeah. response has been like super positive. Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, Often we had done one video with them before, as you were saying, a lot of it, a lot of the content, animated content that we've done with them is usually for um, parishes or school systems. And so we don't always see the, the direct impact of it, um, which isn't to say that it's not there, but, but it was, it is always gratifying to see a kind of a public um, reveal of yeah. some, of some of that stuff. So we did one about the Eucharist that that was fairly well received and and that was encouraging. So it, it feels like it's building off of that energy a bit. Yeah. Um, so let's talk, let's talk. I, what I'd love to do is cause I, I honestly, even from this video specifically, a lot of people have reached out to us and been like, how do you do that? Like, what's the, what are, sure. what are the steps of doing that? Sure. So I think this is a, this is a cool little case study to say, okay, what does an animated project look like from tip to tail? Like right. for in this short explainer format, what are the sort of creative decisions that have to be made to facilitate it? What are the different uh, parts of production? Mm-hmm. I feel like it's a cool case study. And, and even we'll reveal some of the why we made the creative decisions that we made. Sure. I say let's, let's take a look at the video, or some cool. clips from the video, and then we'll break it down. Once we understand that story, we can understand the context of every book of the Bible. So here's the story in less than 10 minutes. Naturally, it starts in the beginning. God speaks, bringing all creation into existence, both the spiritual and the material. All creatures depend upon God as the source of their very being at every moment, including his crowning creation, man. Moses becomes God's messenger, speaking into the darkness and calling his people to the light. God, creator of sky and sea and all the creatures of the earth, draws his people out of bondage through water into freedom. And he promises them a shining land of their own, a piece of paradise. After 70 years of exile, God works in the heart of a foreign king who, against all odds, sends God's people home. They return, they rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Their numbers have dwindled and surrounding world powers continue to oppress them. But many cling to God's promises, fighting and dying for their faith. Jesus is born into humble means. He grows, is baptized, and enters the desert for 40 days, just as the Israelites did before entering the Promised Land. And then his mission begins, to free God's children from slavery to sin. Once, God's presence dwelt in a tabernacle, and now he walks among his people, abiding with them face to face. 
He performs signs and wonders. He teaches, drawing from the prophets and fulfilling all of sacred scripture before him. So the first thing we should probably talk about is how a project like this comes to us. Um, Ascension reached out to us. They said, hey, look, we got this Bible in a year podcast. We really want to do a short form piece to introduce new people to that mm. and to do it basically as a synthesis and a compression of the whole Bible in a year right. project um, into 10 minutes, um, which was obviously it was exciting. And there's a lot of challenges thinking through <laughs> how to scope that out and make it work appropriately. Um, what was great about what they provided and was a little different than a lot of projects we do is they had a script. They knew exactly they had leveraged, you know, an entire year's worth of Father Mike's, you know, uh, storytelling and compressed mm. it down into a really tight little script. And they had some thoughts about aesthetic and things um, that they wanted us to incorporate. Uh, but yeah, so it was interesting to get. It was very, it was like, it had a, a somewhat of a vision to it already. Right. Working in an agency, you'll typically have like, here's an end post, like a finish line we want to cross. Mm. Here are the ideas. Here's what's important to us. Here's what values we want to convey. Here's what we want it to feel like. So you have some of that. Like, you know what, you know, you need a meal, but you don't have the recipe yet. Mm, yeah. And I think that that's like that beginning when you're scoping a project is challenging. Yes. There is a, there's a term. I think I heard this from like theater jargon or something, but the formless hunch. Yeah. And so I think I, I operate out of like a formless hunch a lot. Some of the people from Ascension provided really kind of general guidelines that they'd like the, the video to go in in terms of, they said cinematic, um, high contrast, dark and light. Yeah. And um, rolling off of stuff that we'd done with them before, it was kind of a, a that was a, that started to get to the, the ball rolling. Yeah. Um, it's important to, I think it would be important to talk about some of those other projects that we've done. Cause with Ascension we've done, we've done now hundreds and hundreds of minutes <laughs> of content yeah. with Ascension. And a lot of the projects that we've done with them have been in more of a mixed media format, mm -hmm. a collage style art, right. um, a little bit more. Um, we actually have a series of videos that, you know, not a lot of people, um, maybe, maybe not a lot of people are aware of where it's like short stories about the lives of the saints. Those were, most of those were like cell and mm -hmm. some puppet animation. Um, but this was, they really, the, I'd say the two big things that they talked about a lot were that light and shadow. Mm -hmm. They really wanted light and shadow. Right. They really wanted cinematic depth. Mm -hmm. Eventually when we were working in the creative, um, you know, creative brief process with them and kind, kind of trying to define the aesthetic, it was, painterly yes. having it be painterly right. and then the other thing too was the color right. there's a subtle color story in it that i don't think for a casual viewer they would have any idea how much intentional thought went behind the color yeah that's a cool story honestly because do you want me to yeah let's talk about that? color okay so one of the things that that we know about the adventure bible timeline yeah, let's back that up because Father <clears throat> Father Mike Schmidt's his podcast Bible in a Year is also tied to uh, Ascension's um, program. It's called the Great Adventure Bible Story, right? And it breaks down the Bible into twelve key times, as it all comp it composes one narrative. Um, that's Jeff Cavins. That's Father Mike Schmidt's is working on it with him. Now it's basically chunking the Bible into narrative components, and as a long-standing brand thing they've had all of these colors associated with each of mm -hmm. these parts of the Bible. So, yeah, I mean, based off of that, we know when we were talking to Ascension, they said there's this there's these colors for this whole timeline through the Bible, and we want each part of the script to um, have that color represented in yeah. some way. So we were we were going back and forth, but it, uh, I say we were banging our heads. We were banging our heads against the wall <laughs> in terms of trying to figure out how to accommodate that. I mean, it makes sense, but we didn't want it to to look, I guess, overly didactic or just really over the nose. Yeah, we wanted it to be to be impactful, but not in a way that um, took away from just the, the animation. Yeah, because they kind of they kind of threw us this like they kind of threw us this puzzle that we had to put together, which was, we want you to include the brand colors. Right. We want it to be subtle. Right. And we want it to be painterly. 
And figuring out how to put those together was a lot more technical than I think a lot of people might realize. Yeah. And, and so I kind of, my, my background is um, um, in visual art and painting and design. And I, a book that came to mind was from uh, this great, this great art, I guess you would call him an art instructor, but he, he did the Dinotopia books, uh, James Gurney. He has a book called Color and Light that I was looking at trying to get inspiration for how can we incorporate color and he had this section on color scripting which essentially is like storyboarding but for color you're basically kind of just getting a general feel for the colors throughout a sequence of images for for animation they do it in film and stuff and it kind of struck me that we we hadn't done that before yeah in in, in the sense at least in, in that in, way in, for sure in, so I started talking to Joe um, and we found a book that you had of Pixar color scripts and we started kind of discussing that and Joe had done these awesome boards based on the script and we're like, well, let's just, let's basically plot out all the, all the, t the color timeline per section. Yeah. And so that each section of the, the 10 minutes will be, kind of cast in that color and that ended up working out really well it's very i don't know how you would say it, it's not alarming but it's definitely felt it almost feels subconscious how it yeah um and it feels when i watched it how the effect of the color had it was like i i love how this feels like film or something yeah. it, it feels cinematic to me and i think it was a first inroad into that for animation here of just like getting that emotional storytelling with color. Yeah. You know, I think we, before we had been kind of thinking frame by frame with color and, and in this sense it started to, so we're going to do color scripting in the future, I think, because so it was kind of beautiful in the sense that this having to tackle this problem, I think opened the door for us a little more on that. This is a really great tool. Yeah. To, I think the difference, I think the difference in a lot of the projects that we have been working on is that the aesthetic of them is so different. Mm -hmm. um, this one had a different aesthetic um, and the, the aesthetic demanded a color script logic because you could have done this video in like a mixed media or collage format, mm. in which case a lot of motion graphics people will think about in terms of like a color palette right. that you're deploying or like a yeah. shift over time. But this was like, this was very much considered because of the way our pipeline was it was considered uh, more traditionally like this really did follow a very traditional sort of animation pipeline compared to a lot of the sort of MoGraph pipelines that we have for other stuff. I didn't think about that, but that, that makes a lot of sense because when I think of motion graphics, the, the idea of just using kind of a um, not static in a negative way, but a, kind of a, a set palette that you, you kind of use in different ways throughout compared yeah. to this, which feels more tied. To, maybe that's why I think of that seeing it used made me think of cinema or film because it's dramatic. Yeah. That the color there is attached to a story arc and stories about transformation over time. Um, and so it, it wouldn't be a static palette. It'd be a kind of, so the color in a sense moves with the story arc, um, which is kind of what the color timeline was trying to do is, is, is give a kind of color a motif for each part of that, that, that color, that change in story, which, yeah. So I, that makes sense to me. So I could see, I could see like someone looking at this and wondering, it's like, well, why didn't you just take, well, they have green in this section, you know, they have purple in the Kings section. Why don't you just like put a purple overlay over what you're doing? <laughs> you know, sure. Why? Cause I think one of the things that was interesting is how you attacked the tonal range of colors and how it deployed yeah i think we one of the things that they they kept, they talked about a lot was they wanted it to be really realistic which is a an interesting thing uh, interesting thing to balance with style because people often associate animation with um to be honest immaturity but yeah. i've always had a sense that animation in itself is uh similar to comics it it, it can have a prejudice or a bad rap associated with it as as if it can't at attack or handle content 
that's more mature. I mean, there's there's a lot of mature things in the Bible that that it's not just a children's book. I mean, it can obviously you can cater to children and and how you talk about it, but but in terms of the audience for this, they wanted it to be um, not just for children, but for something for families. And so we we had to hash that out a lot. Um, uh, Joe, who who helped on this a lot. Um, Joe Fifelski, our, our storyboard artist on this project. Storyboard artist. He also did a lot of the, uh, he helped a lot with the style. We, we were kind of, I call it rock tumbling. We, we kind of started, Emma Green um, was, we were all kind of sharing art uh, style frames. We were trying styles out. And, and one of the cool innovations for us that we hadn't done before was working on, on top of each other's art. Yeah. And I thought that was a really interesting um, step forward in the sense that one person started working off of the other and then trading it back and forth. Yeah, that was the first time I'd, I'd done that, and I found that to be a really, a really neat collaborative way to work. Um, and it, out of that kind of came um, a style that that really, I think, balanced um, that kind of animation aesthetic and a realism. So basically what you're saying is like you came to a style after you rock tumbled where you're yeah. all through your creative like ideas in, and right. you get to the point where you have a style, character forms, compositional logic, things like that. And then you have mm -hmm. to address color within that context. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the, the issue with using color is just like an overlay that might work for some styles, but when it comes to realism, it would, it would basically look like, you're looking through tinted glasses, which yeah. which is an immediate. There's something artificial about this, and yeah. so, it, it that was one of the reasons I was looking at James Gurney's book, Color and Light, because he he has a lot of material about how to make something. He also has another book called Imaginative Realism: How to Paint and Draw Things That Don't Exist But Make It But Make It Look Like It Does, and so he has a huge emphasis on like natural phenomenon, and so. One of the ways we were filtering through that it was like, how do you, how does light work, or how does how does a certain atmosphere, if it's dark and moonlit, well, everything's going to be blue, or if if there's a certain natural phenomenon going on, you're going to get this color. So we had to kind of filter it through that a little bit, um, and to make it believable. But also, like if you look at, it's amazing what you can do with color within a net, like kind of the limitation of like what could naturally occur. Yeah. Cause some of the scenes tilt, uh, toward where the, where the scenes, like I think of like the garden of Eden scene or some of the, mm -hmm. the Jesus, um, public ministry scenes, like those are very naturalistic lighting. You have a lot of the natural greens and things like that. But then I think about like the Egypt scenes, Mm -hmm. where the color wash is more apparent or like King David's reveal. Mm -hmm. That's like a, like really saturated purples and things like that. But it, it still feels somewhat natural. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I actually don't know. Like yeah. I actually don't know how you accomplish that, but like, how do you get those tonal markers to be there still feeling somewhat natural, even though it is stylized? A lot of inspiration like reading old Disney books, like the illusion of life um, from some of the nine old men animators, that book was amazing. And just really honestly, or like the way the Disney um, animation studio, um, just the history and origins of that is just so inspiring. They have some principles I think about a lot. One of them, <laughs> this is like the good side, the good side of stolen valor in the sense of the concept of stolen valor is like you're you're taking you're taking honor from something that doesn't belong to you and um <laughs> but but honestly good art i'm going to give you a direct example of this disney said this is a paraphrase but he's like we have to be able to do the ordinary things if we want to do the extraordinary things for example pixie dust or how they animated um fairy dust they they studied natural phenomenon. They studied how ice forms. They studied how fire moves. Um, basically, just kind of reverse engineered God's brain with in terms of how he create like how those things work. And then you can, for example, let's take fire like how fire moves, but let's bash that with the physics of how 
um, ice freezes. And now you have, and if you animate something like that, now you have an, you have something that looks magic, but it's, it's stolen valor. It's stolen, <laughs> it's stolen the validity it has because it, it signifies something that we recognize. So even if, even if there's sections in this that the color is a little extreme, you can, you can get away with stuff, you know, yeah. because you can cut, it's almost like, um, how caricatures work. Caricatures function like they you they work because you're not distorting something, you're exaggerating it. So animation is a really great medium to reach people because you can exaggerate things for the sake of like clarity and making things really obvious and make them a little it's like putting things under a magnifying glass and making it that much quicker to discern. Yeah, because because reality has layers and layers and layers of nuance and data. And animation is really a medium. It's not just a medium of interpretation, but it's a medium of reduction. You're reducing yeah. and you're reducing and you're reducing until the flavor is like so potent. Yeah. You're like that guy's mad. Yeah. Because his, because there's steam coming out of his head. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, that person's in love because their eyes just turned into hearts. And even though that's like, even though that's like, uh, I'm being silly in my examples, it's like reducing down to like a potent, uh, yeah, a potent minimum. It's like boiling like sap like the tree water into like, you want to get to that maple syrup, you know? And, and, and that takes work. It's like, people don't want to boil their, their tree water all day. <laughs> they just want maple syrup. They don't go to the store to buy, you know, tree water. So suffice it to say, <laughs> suffice it to say, suffice it to say, there's a lot of logic and even just getting to the color script or getting to a style. Yeah. There's a lot that you're pouring yourself into when thinking this is like, this isn't, you know, the, the, I think in the age of AI where people are like, I want a realistic picture of uh, Abraham looking up into the sky. Um, it's like, oh, and then it spits out an image. You're like, oh, like, oh, it did it. Yeah. But like the process of a human being <laughs> getting to an image that's nuanced and refined is like, you have to throw a lot against the wall. You have to be thinking a lot intentionally yeah. about form, distilling, getting to the point. Um, to get, and then from an agency side, getting to the point where you as artists are feel comfortable with the style, you know, that you've done your diligence on getting it to the point where you feel like it exceeds or sorry, you get it to the point where you feel like it hits those, um, important creative and compositional things that make it good. Right. right. You're protecting the quality of it as an artist. And then for an agency or for the client that it fulfills the mandate that they have creatively organizationally, missionally, that it all works together. Um, and this was, I mean, this is a pretty quick timeline. This project yes. came together over the matter of a few weeks. Yeah, I I think it's been cool to work with Ascension over with, um, we've we've had several kind of like long, long term, this one was a, a quick turnaround, but things we worked on before, I mean, we were work on for months uh, yeah. on one project because it was, it was a big, and it's been a blessing to be able to have some years under our belt doing that because yeah. it's been I've there's been things that I feel like we've learned as a team over time to kind of like slowly uh, adapt certain principles and we're still we're still working on it we're still we're still growing and but um one of them being essentially a quote comes to mind from Abraham Lincoln about it, to me it's about pre-production but he's like if you if you give me seven it's something like this i'm always paraphrasing but if you give me seven hours to chop down a tree i'll spend six sharpening the axe yeah and you know that i think there's as a creative team of people i have always been one to jump in into the, what feels like the act of creativity yeah and over the past few years i've I've honestly been moving, not that I don't feel creative, but I've become more cautious about jumping in with about jumping in and wanting to be more strategic about setting ourselves up for success. And uh, Joe Feifelski, who works here, is, is a great component of this of pre-production in the sense that how can we how can we basically figure out as much about how this thing's going to play out before yeah. we get into the weeds and get into really territory where things are going to be really time consuming. And so storyboarding obviously is a, is a, in, in a way, a, a very risk, uh, a, 
a low risk activity. It's yeah. paper, it's pencils, it's thinking through things. Thinking doesn't cost as much money as rendering something out for a day and then it not working yeah. for the story. And so just really pushing into like storyboarding, but that why that was why the color scripting was so helpful to do was that saved us a lot of time. Yeah, I think like I think that's a skill that a lot of artists and creatives own have to learn when they move to working with a team. Mm. I think uh, this is just going to be Peter and Gary have quotes from different people. Why not? Right? Yeah. But like there's this conversation that was between Stephen King and George R. R. Martin. I believe this is what it was. And they were talking about that there are two different types of writers. There's a gardener and there's an architect. Mm. And the gardener just sort of like plants the seeds, what grow, lets the plants grow. It like sort of like uh, it grows and you help form it as it matures. And an architect plans every detail down to the, to mm. the absolute uh, smallest detail and then can execute on it. And Stephen King is more of the guy who's like, I'm going to chain smoke cigarettes and I'm going to plow through this and I'm going to start from the beginning and okay. I'm going to see where it goes. And then George R. R. Martin is like, I'm planning every plot detail. Hmm. Um, I think like there are a lot of, and I'm one of these guys too, who like if I'm working by myself, I could jump in yeah. with two feet yeah. and I could create something and I can iterate as I go and form it as like a potter on a wheel, like get to the final destination. But as soon as you're working in a creative team, right. having planning on the front end is essential because there's so much information about the logic of why this shape is this way or why this color works this way or how the motion works, that getting all of those details, getting it so that you can all be reading off the same sheet music and play together mm -hmm. in a symphony. Mm -hmm. It's like that, like the improv like the improvisational part of you as a creative has to happen at the beginning and has to be codified. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It, when at a company, you you do feel you start to feel the impact of not being able to have things codified yeah. because that that affects other people, and so it goes down to that clarity. Honestly, yeah. again, yeah. it goes down to that clarity as like a creative leader, or creative director on a project. It's like boiling it down so that they can understand, and you can say like. Here's the vision. Yeah. So that they can then let that vision unfold. And I and I I think the ideal would be an arch, you know, like like some sort of architectural building with a with garden on the roof or something, <laughs> you know, in the sense that that structure can almost enable because what happens with there's no structure is that most of the time and effort is spent on putting out fires from miscommunications. Yeah. And if there is a structure that that opens up space for for creativity within limits, it's like Robert Frost saying, you know, I don't want to play tennis without um, a court, yeah. you know, like what's the point? And so he, he was talking about the need for limitation there. But I think if you can have things really clear, then yeah. there's room for, within that still. It's not like things can't creative things can't happen within the, you know. Yeah, no, totally. That's the first stage of the creative process is on an agency. Client will come with a goal. We want it to be cinematic. We want to boil the Bible down to 10 minutes. We want it to have realism, cinematic qualities, depth, color. Right. We go through this long process of iteration with our artists, which punctuated process in this one because it was very short timeline. Um, come up with a creative angle come up with the aesthetic of the thing, come up with how characters look, come up with uh, a realism for the lighting, but still having that style. We have that. We say, this is our vision. This is what it looks like. Client says, all right, full steam ahead. Um, Joe Fafelski had done wonderful storyboards that really yeah. helped the vision. And we pulled Joe to work on this specifically because his bench of experience, he's got a ton of experience mm -hmm. in live action storyboarding. Mm -hmm. So like his sensibility really would make sense here. It would feel, you'd feel that cinema. Um, it would, you'd feel that depth because he knows that world. And then so Absolutely. we had that, we had those beautiful storyboards. We had those character designs. We had that color script. And then we have to figure out the logic of the motion, right? How it moves, how it feels. Right. And for every project, um, any animated or motion graphics project, there's a question of how much is it going to move? How much uh -huh. is it going to feel? And that has to come down to budget and time and all those things. 
But in this one, the emphasis Ascension had really was on the character forms themselves and less on the characters moving. Okay, yeah. So, okay, well, a few things come to mind in the sense of, like, when we had talked to Ascension and they talked about it being cinematic and bright, dark, and light, I remember getting the color scripting book from the library. We have a nice library coordination with a lot of art books, and there was another one when... Um, they mentioned dark and light that that you and Bill had showed me a long time ago that we still had about like film noir like um, really dark and light and so I remember discussing that with Joe um, being like just these types of things that he was clearly really good at and familiar with uh, in terms of his storyboards already kind of look like that but these really bold distinct dark and light patterns so that was kind of one principle another principle um, was <clears throat> that so much obviously the bible in 10 minutes is the most bird eye view of something because it's it's so many stories yeah but they're trying to give that kind of super story like the story that that mm. kind of weaves throughout all these the but meta story the meta story the the story of stories a through line and it's not a type of animation where it's um an actual story being told beat by beat between people. It's, yeah. it's more basically one of the principles we had to figure out was like, okay, this needs to essentially all the animation needs to be within transitions from one scene to another. And we have to have this thing feel fluid throughout. And the only way we can really pull that off, I think is if it's just transition, pause, yeah. transition, pause, transition, pause. And so, so much like of the a, animation. It's, a, it's like a montage format. It's a series of vignettes yes. of time periods where basically the only consistent thing is the light and the dark because that was a core metaphor that the director on it uh, from Ascension, Matt Longua had, which is the light is God's activity and the darkness is what God is overcoming. Right? Yeah, that was the mm -hmm. core visual thing. That's basically one of the few characters right. that leads us through every composition. Right. The other thing was thing from what I, from what I've experienced with like previous projects is like the the mortal enemy of animation is monotony. And so what I found myself doing in projects we've had to fight this before, especially when it, it animation is a laborious. Process, process you yeah. know it's like people have to go into monk mode and um it's a lot it can be isolating but you're, you're just plowing into this thing for a really long time and um it's very it's like pay it's there's a great payoff you know but i mean there's the the, the downside of that that you have to fight against is uh, things can flatten out yeah and um that's and and when something flattens out it's not interesting because if it's not if something's generic and not interesting to you it's a pretty good, you have a pretty good indication, you know, the personal is universal in the sense that if you're not excited by it, no one else is going to be. Yeah. And so it's always something that has to be fought against. Um, and so for the boards, there was the, the dark and light was a cool contrast thing. So if you think of the opposite of generic, and this is again, something that the, the, the nine old men would talk about in their principles. One of the principles of animation was exaggeration, but another one was appeal and one of the principles in that is you want dynamic shapes or things that, um, that there's a lot of difference that's still within a cohesive uh, format. You know, like a, a big guy and a tiny little girl or a big girl and a tiny little guy. But just to have that con and you and if you look at any animated like a lot of animated stuff, you'll see those those things were intentionally put there, you know, like yeah. the, the the giant and the little boy or like whatever. And. I was thinking about that at the beginning. I'm like, how can we take this thing where we're just transitioning from scene to scene? I want this to feel dynamic, but we, we have to work in a limited space. And we use a storyboarding platform called Boards. Um, shout out boards.com. <laughs> but they, I just happened to find um, a, a worksheet, a free worksheet that they had of all the camera shots. Yeah. All the different types of camera shots. If we have this in front of us while we're we're doing this, like let's get one of each. You know, let's try to get as many different shots as possible, just for the sake of variety within yeah. this. And so, a so, far away shot, an overhead shot, uh, like so, yeah. just to get that contrast. And so, I think so. That was another thing that we talked about. 
And so to boy, to kind of like, to try to rephrase what you're saying, basically you're saying we didn't have, because of the flow of the story, it wasn't like we're following, you know, uh, Popeye, the sailor man on a consistent narrative, right? We're going vignette, we're going montage. So because of that, you actually undercut one of the core things about animation, which is visual uh, variety and composition and characters and all of that, because we're not having that crazy motion to showcase things. So you have to get that variety. You have yeah. to get that. You have to get that cinem cinematic contrast. Right. And how you attacked that was in shot selection. Yeah, in the types and variety of shots. Yeah, getting as much that was I, that was all I said because Joe's an, an insane storyboarder artist, and and all I basically said was, if we could just get as many of these as possible, I think that will help. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> like I don't I don't know much about storyboarding to be honest with you. I was reading the uh, Tony Bancroft book on animation direction, trying to wrap my head around this, and the the it, it said a lot of cool stuff, but one of my favorite quotes from it was I think from I can't remember it was a director, and he's like. The quote was, a director isn't the smartest person in the room. They just know who is, you know? And so I'm like, I don't know this. Like, there's a lot I don't know, but I have these formless hunches. And based off of what the client wants, it's like, all I know is that just generally speaking, here's some principles. Let's just make sure that happens. And then they just did amazing stuff. Well, to quote another guy, yeah. um, just to, as the times of uh, podcasts go, George Lucas said, I think it was George Lucas said, uh, a movie's never finished. It's it just, you run out of time. Yeah. And so I think that was the case Amen. with this one too. It's like, we had a few weeks to get this done. We had a team of people to get this done. Um, I think all of this pre-production conversation is great because once we get to that, when you launch in with your talented artists with all of them, um, they have a clear path to go. And then from there, it's just like, okay, cool. We make little corrections here and there to make sure style is maintained over time uh, until we get to a final project where it feels consistent. It feels like it's come from one mind and one heart mm -hmm. and it's not like a crazy chaotic uh, thing where everyone has a different style. Yeah. Once we, there was a lot of work at the beginning doing that rock tumbling thing where we we're trying to get the style pinned down. A lot of looking at Ivan Earl, yeah. his kind of mixture of painterly and, and um, uh, design, yeah. and sharp shapes, strong, sharp shapes. There's something about Ivan Earl that we were looking at a lot. I should say Ivan Earl is an early mm. Disney god. He's an early Disney legend. Yeah, we should he show would, photos of him. He did the concept art on... Uh, snow or sleeping beauty he had that sort of like realism uh strong designerly 60s shapes yeah um where but they effortlessly feel layered on top of each other yeah it doesn't feel like an imposition it doesn't feel like he's messing things up it feels like a like a different sort of world yeah where things are a little more geometric and have more curvature and yeah it's he just he is one of the best and I think everybody, like a lot of people get behind that. There's something universal about his stuff. It's because every, I mean, people argue on beauty a lot, but one thing that people generally agree on is nature is beautiful. Yeah. And the way that he, there was another quote from some person, I don't know what their name was, but they were like, art isn't copying nature. It's making a point with nature. Mm -hmm. And so you're not just, you're not just, when we, when it comes to realism, you're not just, you know, copying things that that are natural. Yeah. Kind of like a Xerox machine. You're you're understanding how they work and then making a point with it. That's yeah. he embodies that to me, you know, is that and you can feel that in the there's something about design that's very this is what I intend. You know, and yeah. I, I think with traditional uh, painting and drawing, you can there's a temptation to just get lost in rendering what you see. Yeah. And I love that about his stuff, and and we got a lot of that in there. I think he was a really uh, a northern star for when me and Joe and Emma and uh, were trying to figure the style out, um, because he just balances that line a lot, and I it characterizes a lot of like Disney stuff. But it's really, it's interesting how much he brought to the table for them. Yeah, yeah. No, he was he was awesome. I think one of the things you're pointing out, which is just something that I think we we try to do, and I think you're always advocating for is like when you're in the motion graphics agency world <clears throat> and you're doing animation things, it's very easy to have a recency bias towards what your inspiration 
is. Mm. It's very, that's how trends emerge. It's how you get corporate Memphis. It's how you, you get all of that. It's like, you're looking at what was just done. Mm -hmm. What's hot, what's cool, what's whatever. And one of the things that I think is great is going back to what I consider now to be the masters or classics of early animation and saying mm. like, no, they had, there was something there that was not defined by trends because there were no trends back then, mm. <laughs> not in the same way. Yeah, There's something timeless about this and recovering our little version of that, of like reinterpreting our little version of that. Yeah. It's how you get new inventive things yeah. it's a by process of recovery and, and, and going back and, I mean, that's why we have all those books in the library. <laughs> yeah, I I think part of it is going back to what we were talking about early about how light works, how anatomy works. Yeah. Um, how kind of these principles of reality uh, or how you see form, how, how light hits form and stuff like that. Um, those were kind of systematically taught to people or how do you compose a picture? So there, it's this whole building up of skills it's this sense of like, okay, we need to go back to the source because we're losing our roots with reality. I think AI is a good example of that in the sense that like, okay, well, I'm not saying this is bad per se, but like we're departing now from like having an awareness at, at, at a very, I don't know how to put that. Like we're, we're, we're not guiding ourselves at that, at that point. Yeah. And we, there's a lot of tools between me and understanding what, yeah. what I'm actually manipulating. Yeah. Um, Cause you're not observing, you're not observing something Yeah. in order to render it with a point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Th th that's, that's a great point. Like you can't make a point. And I've struggled with this myself is like, I, I think I got so into drawing from observation just as well as I could that I wasn't learning anatomy or I wasn't learning how, things worked on a, like an analytical level. And so I could never really use those things to make a point. I mm. felt like I was always in a sense subservient to them. Right. I think it was, I always felt like they were making a point with me. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's what art education should really do is, is help you make a point with those things that, that you can assimilate how those things work and then, and then, you know, come out, with an authority in a sense, using those things and, yeah. and, and make an argument about life. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think one of the things I want to say is one of the things I love so much about you and your creative process and the intention that you put behind things is like, there's two, it's too often in the commercial art sort of world or, it's, you know, agency world where people are like, I just want to make cool shit. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want to like, that's it. Like, I just want to make it cool. And I hear that all the time and it's so boring to me and it doesn't, it's so their lack of meaning behind it is um, so apparent and I just watch things and it's visual noise and it doesn't have a, a heart and a soul to it. And I think with you and your creative process, what's clear is the amount of intention and thought and philosophy and drop quotes <laughs> that are going on in your head is like, you're putting a lot into coming up with a creative angle and figuring a creative angle out. And I think that's, um, yeah, I mean, I think this work is a testament to that. Thanks. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it's been like for this project, for example, you've always you, like I can I've been able to come to you when like I'm having a meltdown about just holding holding certain aspects of it together. Because, again, like no matter how much um, weight bearing pulls you put in to hold this thing up, sometimes it's just for a multitude of reasons or timelines. You just like, how do you hold this thing together? And um being able to navigate an artistic um, standard, you know, and having a, a certain set of convictions about protecting creativity so that it's, that it's, you know, um, that you honor that, you know, but then at the same time, understanding that we are working for somebody that has a certain sec set of expectations and that we're here to serve and balancing those two things and, and respecting those two things. And I, I've, I've learned a lot from you on that, you know, in the sense that, that it's, it's not, it's not just being like art for art's sake. And it's, and it's not just, we need to make money. So we like survive <laughs> that it's something in the middle. Yeah. And I, and I think you embody that a lot and how you bring up stuff and, and, and you, 
so yeah thank you for that <laughs> it took us a lot longer than 10 minutes to talk about the bible in 10 minutes yeah. But uh, if you're interested in more breakdowns on our creative process at Coronation, uh, tune in to Heralds and Fools, a podcast where we talk shop. Thanks, hey, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, man. Yo, yo, yo. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Heralds and Little Sp- Hey, everyone. Today, I want to talk about the Bible in 10 minutes. Ascension presents <laughs> for this project. And we want to clue you in. (laughs) 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 It's a spicy meatball. Hey, everyone. Today we're talking about animation pre-production. We're talking about... uh, That was good. Hey. Eh. That was close. It was very close. It was very close. Where we talk about passion projects, client projects, and the nitty gritty details of what makes creative life so special. Hey, Peter. What's up, Gary?